Let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this time to come together and study your word. I pray that as we look at um, Jesus' healing of this man and implications and that we're able to see um, behind the evident and we see your true meaning for things happening exactly the way they did because we know it perfectly went according to your plan. So I just pray as we look at this, we see this and we understand more about you so that we can uh, be more like you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're all ready. We'll get ready for uh, starting session number nine. And uh, we're going to be starting in the fifth chapter uh, of, of John. Uh, remember last week we finished up the fourth chapter. And that's kind of characterizes the woman at the well, the Samaritan lady. Jesus went through Samaria. No respectable Jew would ever go through that. We talked about the Samaritans. Uh, and they were part of Israel as the northern kingdom. They were taken over by Assyria. They were disseminated out into the lands and they were half breeds. And so they were really detested by the Jewish Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem, as well as they detested the Orthodox Jews. So remember, they had their kind of their own religious. They followed the five, first five books of the Torah, which is the Old Testament in our, in our vernacular. Uh, but they really didn't follow the prophets or the Psalms or Proverbs or any of the other old books of the, the, the prophets. So it was a mixed religious breed and a mixed uh, racial breed. And so he went through there and he went to the woman in the well that was lost and had been with five men. We don't know whether they were all her husbands but uh, it doesn't tell us that, but it sounds like they were. And the man she was with now was not her husband. And she basically brings the whole city to believe in Christ. And she's the first lady, okay. and also the first person in the Bible that Jesus tells, I am he, I am the Messiah. So it's interesting, it's another first, and the first is to a woman at the well, and she's about as lost as you can get. <laughs> she's not of noble character. She's not of a noble class. Uh, she's maybe. Okay. So it's just interesting the way Jesus went to that person. Thank you. That he was you. Connected. So with that, we're moving into chapter five. And with chapter five, I'll turn it over to Nett. She's going to I'll read the first four verses. Again, this is a little different. Uh, actually, chapter five starts the real execution. So what do you mean? From chapter five on until Christ is on the cross, the Jews wanted to kill him. It starts in chapter five. That's where we are. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nett to start the first few verses. So verses one through four, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethsaida, no Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So do you think that the people were generally healed in this pool? Uh, they thought they were going to get cured. That's what I understand. Yeah. So you know what? We don't really know for sure if this was a legend but right. I think that John would write about it as he did if this was just kind of a legend that people had. So we are thinking that probably there was some healing there, whether some of it was self thought or, you know, whether they were really healed or they thought they were healed. And certainly um, people can, or they think that possibly some of the people who went through healings became ill again later down the road. Uh, interestingly, that when they do archeological evacu 
evacuations, archaeological excavation, excavations, excavations, yeah. excuse me, they found, they actually found this pool. It's exactly how they described it with the columns. And so the, the sick did come here. Some phenomenon would stir the water and people seem to be getting healed. Now, it, it, it's not impossible that God would heal people like this. God had some unique and strange way in the Old Testament that people yeah. were healed. Um, there was a group in, in Kings that were purified by a pot of stew. Um, Nahum, in, we find, was, had in Second Kings, was healed by touching the bones of Elisha. Um, and Nahum was in, excuse me, in the Jordan River. Other people were healed by touching the bones of Elisha. So God can heal in very unexpected ways. So it is very possible that this was a mechanism that God was using to heal people. We, we don't know that answer for certain. But we do know, and as we go into the next verses, um, this man was getting, was frustrated many times by not being able to get to the pool first. It was only the first person that in. Another in interesting thing I just want to point out, it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. So if you remember, there's like four main feasts where all of the Jews were supposed to come to Jerusalem um, to, set, to honor the feast or celebrate the feast. And um, they pretty much, pretty much most people feel that this was one of those four major feasts so that there were lots and lots of people at the temple at this feast time. So that would kind of add to why there's so many multitudes and crowds around. And we're going to see that coming up. Yeah, a couple of interesting points to, to add is most uh, scientific evidence around this pool leads to this was a pool that had some springs at the bottom of the pool. And if you've ever been around water, every once in a while, you'll see bubbles come up. And that was what most people speculate. It was the pool releasing gas or, or bubbles from the spring water, and that would stir the water. And the interesting point about that is verse four is for an angel went down at a certain time we find that verse four is not in the early manuscript of the Gospel of John. And so it was added later to basically give some, I think, of the people's belief, false belief, that really an angel did come down. Could have God done it? I agree with Annette completely. Yes, he could have. But John, from what we can determine, the early manuscripts did not have that in here which meant the scribes in translating it included that to give you what the legend was around the people. This is what the people thought, but there's no real documented proof that this is what it is. So just an interesting note there as you look at it. And we, we have that quite often in scripture where the earlier manuscripts does not have that, but then you find a later manuscript that does. And the way it does get added is that it, it uh, people come together and agree that it should or should not be added uh, so that, they, that now we have just one set. We don't have two sets, one with it, one without it. And I, that's a great way of really approaching it. But with that, we'll go to the next section. This is five through nine. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man uh, was made well took up his bed and walked. And that day was Sabbath. The end of that verse, again, is one of these that is not in all manuscripts. Uh, we, we know it was a Sabbath because 
they will go, they'll come to him later, the Jewish leaders, and say, why do you do this on the Sabbath? But this being added that it was a Sabbath is really for clarification, because later on, we're going to see what happens with that. So with that, the, the very first question here is, what do you think is the significance of saying that he was really in this condition for 38 years? Why 38 years? Um, well, yes, he was born that way. Yeah. Maybe he was 30 years old or, you know, uh, I really know why he got, couldn't get, uh, you know, was paralyzed when he, in, you know, like an accident or something. There, there is no explanation as whether he was born that way, whether mm -hmm. it was an accident. We just know he was. We'll right. see later that there is some speculation that he became that way because of this sin. Um, oh. That's nothing that we can hang our hat on. But okay. the to the 38 years is when you go back and you look at the Israelites and they crossed the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness, we think of that around 40 years, and 38 years. Uh -huh. so this 38 years mimics Israel sinning against God God trying to help them and then turn away from God. He gave them the manna, remember, and then they complained. He gave them quail. They didn't have water, and then they had water. He kept providing for them, even though they kept turning to idols and always turning away from God. So this 38-year period, what we speculate is that Christ is using this man to refer back to Israel, the nation who was paralyzed spiritually for 38 years as they wandered in the wilderness. And so that's what most commentators will tie back to the 38 years. Again, there's nothing that tells us that is exactly why. It's really from doing the research that you could come up with that, that answer. But it is curious that it's so exact. And what we learn when we're studying the Bible, when you see something like, 38 years, and it's exact, it's usually referencing back to something significant. And yeah, if it says around something or approximately, that's a different issue. So it's just something to always keep in mind as you do your Bible study. So why do you think that he asked the man, do you want to be made well before healing him? Why do you think he asked that question? Uh... Well, just he want where he I would say he wanted the man to believe in him and he wanted to know whether he believed in Christ. That's a so, really why what was his feeling about mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, Jesus. What he thought That's about it. That's a really good thought. That is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now what we do know is this man we're going to find out has no idea that this is christ he doesn't know who he is at all right so, but he i think he will come to know that right it's a little confusing why there, there's a few reasons why jesus could have asked him that the first one being if you're coming from an eastern culture um you could lose you could be making a fairly decent living from begging as a crippled person and it could be that he didn't want to lose this source of income or didn't, you know, it could be that he, he was satisfied where he was. Now, if he was satisfied where he was, I don't know why he would be trying to get into the pool to be made well. So that kind of goes against each other. Another thing, another thing um, people said is, well, um, he knew what his life was like. He knew what to expect from his life as a paralyzed man, but he didn't have any idea what to expect if he wasn't. And so it might be he was just more comfortable in staying still or staying where he was. More than likely, I think it goes more along the line that, that Juan's answer went along. This Jesus is saying, do you want to be healed? And he's not necessarily only talking about physically, but that he is making a point, do you want to be healed spiritually? 
because we do know that later on Jesus is going to come across this man again and tell him to sin no more. So I think that hopefully at that point, there was a big impact and this became one of his devoted followers. And that's what I would hope, but we don't know that. Um, so anyway, that I think those are the reasons that I think Jesus was probably talking deeper or broader than just physical healing. I think he was talking about complete healing physically and spiritually. Um, but we don't know. It, it, he wanted to, to help, again, as Juan said, to develop the man's faith. Does he have faith? Do you want to be healed? And if he says yes and looks at this man expectantly with an expected yes, then he is yeah. faith. And so I think all of those go into play for why um, Jesus would ask if they want to be made well. Yeah, and the thing that we don't want to overlook is we look at this man He's no different than a lot of men and women today. Don't think this is unique. There's a great number of men and women today that are sick or have some type of infirmity that have grown to be comfortable in that sickness or infirmity because they may not have to work any longer. They may be able to just sit and read, and not do anything. And to be made well means you have to do something you weren't doing before. And so what happens is people, even today, they get comfortable somewhat in their sickness. I'm not saying everybody, but this man was comfortable to some degree in his sickness because it, then that told, told you, he asked, do you want to be healed? His answer was not yes. He gave him an excuse. Why? Yeah. So if I came up to you and you had cancer and I said, you want to get well, I think your answer would be yes. <laughs> Cure me. Right. No, yeah. no, oh, I can't get well because, or you have some excuse, whatever. So you look at this man and look at us today, all of us as humanity. And we have a way of not just saying, yes, Jesus, cure us. We have to look for an excuse for it. So and that's answer this a little bit. Uh, do you think the man's faith played a role in healing? The man. The man. Do I repeat it, please? Repeat the question. Do you think the man's faith is what really got him healed, that he had faith in Christ? Did it play a role? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. In most of the cases, that is true. Here we get a mixture. Most commentators don't think the man ever had faith. He never had faith. He never asked who Jesus was. Now, if you just got healed after 38 years of not walking, don't you mm -hmm. be asking, who are you? <laughs> what is your name? Uh, I want to know more about you. He just got up and took his mat and walked away. And so most people believe his faith had nothing to do with this. And, and the reason for that is we think all the time that we have to respond with faith for God to act. And we're actually taught that over and over. But the fact is God is sovereign. We're looking at a man that did not respond in any way in faith, and yet God still healed him for a reason. And we'll hit on that reason as we go through this a little further. But it's an interesting point. I don't, my opinion, I'm not sure he had any faith yet, even though he got up and he walked. But that's just my opinion. Next. Step. So verses 10 through 13. How is it, uh, excuse me, let me start with read the, read the uh, verses. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man that you said to you, take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So how is it that Jesus is in the midst of this huge multitude of people 
he heals somebody and nobody recognizes it. How do you think that that's possible? Well, certainly if Jesus wished to remain anonymous at this time or wished to be, remain hidden, he could stand right there and be hidden. Um, he would be able to withdraw and just not be seeing the crowd. They would, that he could set that up. Um, I don't think that Jesus intended to have this mass healing. And if everybody, if he was very obvious and healed this man and everybody saw, then all the people around the pool would be coming unto him to be healed as a mass healing. And we know in the scripture, Jesus never had these mass physical healings. He didn't like do like a, a healing service really? where all the people in the service were getting healed. He did that spiritually. He healed them spiritually in mass groups, but never did these mass healings of physical ailments. Um, so he either kept it purposely. Remember, we talked about this maybe being during a feast, and that's why there's so many multitudes of people there. But he either did it purposefully or another thing is that the people were so focused on that pool watching that pool to get into it that they didn't see there was another way to be healed and that's like us way too often too often we're so focused on the one way to do something that we kind of ignore that there are other possible ways and that's kind of a lesson for us here don't overlook alternatives you know that and, and a lot of religions will do that. When I say religion and not, not believing in Christ, but a lot of churches will say, well, you have to do it this way or you're not saved. You have to do it this way or you're losing your salvation. You have to do it this way. And, and that may not be what God has in mind. God sometimes uses alternatives. So this is a good lesson for us to keep our minds open and pray that God will lead us and show us his perfect way and not a way that we expect. The next question is, is an interesting question as well, is who do you think actually broke the Sabbath law? Jesus or the man or both of them broke Sabbath law? The law of the Sabbath, should I say? Oh, okay. Uh, I would say Jesus. Okay. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. The man did because uh, for you to carry your bed was wrong, was not lawful. Right. And mm -hmm. both, yeah, both, mm -hmm. of, both of you correct, but both of you are incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They both brought, broke the law, but not God's law of Sabbath. They broke, they broke the Jewish law. Pharisees' laws that they established for Sabbath, not necessarily what God established for Sabbath. And God never said he doesn't work on, on Sunday, so he didn't break it uh, he, for sure. But according to the Jewish law, you're correct. Both of them, Jesus, Jesus broke it as well as the man. But God said, Never said that. Jesus uh -huh. healing a man on a Sabbath. What's wrong with that? Right. Um, okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's like a man oh, really? drowning. Okay. He's going down, or a woman, or a child. And you say, I can't save you. It's Sunday. How ridiculous is that? Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. But Jewish law is that way. The Jewish took the law and it was actually, you broke the law if you move furniture outside of the house. But if you moved it in the house, you didn't break the law. Was he in bed and he was moving furniture outside the house? Well, God never established his law that way. The Jewish people did. So they were right. breaking Jewish law, but not necessarily God's law. They, we, they went so far as if a person had a needle that was holding their fabric together, their shirt, 
that they were breaking the law because it took work to put the needle in there. And I'm going to give you something a step more ridiculous that's actually fact. April of 1992, a newscast, there was a fire in Jerusalem in an apartment area. And an apartment was on fire. And the Jewish reader, uh, people, the tenants of the apartment, went and got the Jewish leaders and said, it's Sabbath. Can we put this fire out? Can we extinguish it? Can we make a phone call? Yeah, or can we make a phone call? Right. And call the fire department. 911. That was work, right? Thanks. It took the Jewish leaders so long to say that, yeah, you could probably pick up a phone. It burned down two more apartment buildings by the time they oh. got made that decision. And the point I'm trying to make is just how ridiculous their laws were and still are today. So when we talk about who broke the Sabbath, really neither did because it wasn't God's definition of what the Sabbath was and what work is. It was the Jewish and their scribes and lawmakers that established these ridiculous, ridiculous laws. No. Now, is the Sabbath God's law or man-made no. Jewish law? Yes. God had a law don't you know, rest on the Sabbath. Right. The rest of it was Jewish law saying, what does that mean? It means you can't do this or you can do that. You can't. Right, right. That didn't come from God. That came from Jewish making their own interpretation. Of it. Oh, okay. That's why there's two different. Let me give you how ridiculous this is still today. In still today. 2017, uh -oh. 18, 2000, no, 2019, wasn't it? We went to. Yeah, I wasn't sure where. Yeah, yeah. in 2019, that now went to Jerusalem for, we did a tour of the, of the area, the whole countryside. We were there for a good while, actually. We were in a hotel and there's, elevators in the hotel, but one is designated as a Sabbath elevator. You said, what are you talking about? So we got on it by accident. We didn't know, we were, we were ignorant. We just got on yeah. it. And I, I guess. I couldn't pick my floor. You can't push a button and pick a floor. And the people behind us are looking at it. You know, they're kind of getting yeah. a strange look because we really shouldn't have been on that elevator. That was a Sabbath elevator, and it actually had chairs in the elevator because you couldn't stand. That was work. So they would come sit down in the elevator, and they wouldn't have to press a button. It stopped at every floor in the hotel. So when you got on that out elevator, you get off without pushing a button because that was work to the Jewish people. And this was a commercial big-name hotel that had that implemented. The mm -hmm. other part of that is they had two dining areas. They had dining areas where we were with non-kosher prepared food. And they had dining areas for the Jews only that was kosher prepared food. Mm -hmm. yeah. and so there was uh -huh. segregation even between us and Jews in that hotel. It was, it was almost uncomfortable sometimes. And it shows you just how ridiculous some of their traditions are. Yeah, wow. I went down to get some coffee and I was bringing coffee back the first time I got on that elevator and I thought it was possessed or something because it kept starting and stopping starting and stopping and then I was like uh -huh. I'm getting off I got off and I went and found another one um it was scary but we didn't we were kind of ignorant of of um of the of the laws so the next question Ooh. why do you think that Jesus healed on the sabbath and not the day before or not the day after. Do you think that he didn't realize it was a Sabbath? And why would he do this? Okay. And, um, I think that this scenario was purposeful, that Jesus purposefully healed on the Sabbath to bring a confrontation with, with the Jewish leaders. 
Now, I don't think confrontation always means a fight or a mad, bad thing. I think he did this to, to have an audience have a, um, a way for him to try and teach them or show them um, what they do. I think that he wanted to meet them and say, look, you have distorted God's law. God's law is to honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy. Um, and to do good on the Sabbath is honoring God and honoring the Sabbath to do good. So you should be able to do good. Um, and you've kind of distorted all of these laws. You distorted the intent of the Sabbath. And I think that it was set up that Jesus specifically did it on the Sabbath so that this conversation would ensue. Okay. It was written. You know, this also, it was going to something's going to start. You know, to because uh, he went to, uh, to you know, to uh, I forgot the name of the town. Uh, to, where was it? Where was it? Who was where he was crucified? In Jerusalem. Yeah, it was in Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem, right? So he knew that he was confrontation is going to start then because yeah. he, he from the countryside. So now he's going to Jerusalem to. Uh, Crucified. Yeah. Uh, crucified because he knew that it was going to happen, but he wanted a, a confrontation so people would know, like us, what he's going through. That's a good point. Yeah. So it's, and, uh, that's what I think. Okay. The next section of verse 14 through 18. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing could come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. This is the start of the persecution. That's, that's Yeah, because he had done these things on a Sabbath. Remember, I told you that this was a Sabbath. This is just tying those things together. So this is actually in John's early manuscripts. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews saw all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That's blasphemy, yes. right? Right. Jewish eyes, that's stoning words, right? Mm -hmm. Even breaking the Sabbaths is stoning. Now he's doubled it. So the first question, and we kind of talked about this already, do you think the man's infirmity was due to sin in his life? Okay. There's not a clear answer here. This is going to be nothing but opinion. Is the fact is Jesus comes to him and searches him out in the crowd so that he can identify with Jesus now, know Jesus' name, but he tells him, sin no more. So, or worse things would happen. You know, what is the worst thing that could happen? Well, the, um, he, they, they could be punished only by the Jews, not, um, or, not by God. Yeah, but what, what do you think Jesus is referring to here? He's not talking about physical punishment. He's not talking about being put in jail or rip, whipped or he, he's not talking about that here. We, we missed this and I missed it too. Is this is spiritual. This is not physical. The guy's focused on physical only. And Jesus is telling him sin no more or it's going to be worse. You know what's worse? It's spending eternity in hell. And that's out of unbelief. And Jesus is basically telling him, mm -hmm. you keep going, your unbelief is going to put you in hell. And that's for eternity. And that's going to be a lot, lot worse than your infirmity or anything man can do to you. So right. that's the message he's trying to get across. So the next question is, what, what can we tell about this man that he went back to the Jews and said it was Jesus that healed him? 
what do you think about this guy? Jesus tells him, sin no more, finds him. He says, okay, this is the guy, it's Jesus. So he runs and tells a Jew. What, what can we tell about him? How would he even know that it was Jesus? Well, we don't know every word Jesus said when he met to him, but, or if he could have asked somebody, who was that? They just talked to me and somebody, well, that was Jesus of Nazareth. Somehow he realized it was Jesus. Of Nazareth. Um, we don't know exactly how he knew that. Um, but what we can tell is Jesus clearly tells him sin no more or worse things will happen. And it doesn't seem to have an impact on him. The first thing he does is run back to the Jewish leaders who just question who was it and say, hey, I know who it is now. I know. I figured out who it is. I found him. It's, it's Jesus. And um, <laughs> But that tells us is he was clearly more concerned about seeking the favor of men than of Christ or of God. He was more wow. worried about pleasing man than he was in pleasing God. And, and I, was, I was thinking that um, he wanted to um, be noticed as a witness of okay. some sort. That's, that's what I that's a great point, Jean. Um, we, I don't know that anybody ever said that, but we can't say that he wasn't going back to testify that Jesus is the Christ that can heal. We don't know that. It's not really spelled out like this, but you're very, very possibly could be, as you say, and that's, that's an interesting way to look at it. I think that's very possible. And we just know that he was more worried about pleasing um the man that he was with God but there is to not say he was terrible or whatever there was um a there was a law that he could have been terrified of being stoned to death so the law was if you broke the sabbath um unintentionally without realizing it you had to go make a sacrifice but if you intentionally broke the sabbath you had to be stoned to death so, of course, now he's fearful for his life. And so we don't know what his motivations were, but we can't really be very critical. Okay. Yeah, right here. Okay. What, how is this healing different from the healing in chapter four with the noble man that came to, to, to Jesus and asked that his son be healed? And I think that was actually chapter. Uh, um, Jesus approached this this person, and I. Um, it was that the Roman soldier? Right. Yeah, that runs. Roman soldier. Yeah, he son. came to, to Jesus and asked one of his servants was sick. No son. The son. Yeah. Right. That, that's exactly right. What you're saying. Yeah. Yes. In that. In that case, the person was seeking Jesus, seeking, right. asking for his help. In this case, right. he was not seeking nor asking Jesus for his help and never right. recognizes him or even if he's grateful that he got it. There's no, he doesn't say thank you. He doesn't go out and jump around and, and, and rejoice that he's healed. So there's, yeah. there's, no, there's completely difference here. And that message is, we are all lost and we have no capacity to heal ourselves spiritually except through Jesus. Amen. Okay. So here we're looking at healing on a physical aspect, but the issue here that Jesus is focusing on is not physical, but spiritual. And the message is while it's two entirely different scenarios between the noble man asking Jesus and this guy not even seeking Jesus. Uh -huh. Both of them or Jesus has come to, and it's only through Jesus do you get spiritual salvation and spiritual help, not what man does. And so it's very different, but also the similarity here is that it's only Jesus that can give you that. And that's really the underlying message. So the next question is, how did the Jews know that Jesus's comment about being the son of God actually inferred equality to God. Because he's saying he's the son of God, not that he's making himself 
equal with God, but how did they understand him to say he was equal with God? And if you don't know the original Hebrew language, this is an impossible question to answer. So Jesus yeah. used this term son of, which is bar. So if your name is like bar Jonah or bar, um, that means you're the son of Jonah. And when you use that term, it means that you assume the responsibilities, the characteristics, the level, you assume everything of the father as his equal. And it's because of the word, he didn't use a word that just meant he was inferior to God or an underling of God. He uses the word bar, which means son of, which imputes equality with God. And they understood completely what he was saying. And he knew what he was saying. Um, he was stating truth. And, and that is what riled them up. Okay. And the very last question is very simple here is, what would happen if God did nothing on Sundays, on the Sabbath, or Saturday night and Sunday morning, however you want to look at the Sabbath, or Friday night, the way the Jews look at it? I would say it would be a normal day. If God did nothing, you think it would be a normal day? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't have the answer. I can give you... I don't have an answer either. <laughs> I took that one out of the hat. What I'm is... If God didn't keep the universe moving and the sun no. coming up and the sun going down and the rain falling and the stars kept in their place, the universe would collapse. So this thought process is God is working continuously to keep all this going. It's not God doesn't rest because he doesn't need to rest. You know, he doesn't take a rest. This whole rest issue is because of man's need right. for rest. God yeah. God's need for rest. So that's how, that's how a lot of people take it. I'm not saying you're correct or incorrect. Well, and I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the way most people take this is God doesn't need Sabbath and he's constantly keeping everything working. Oh, uh, does he heal people on Sundays? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's no day of the week that says, oh, God can't heal. You know, so he's working all the time, 24 by 7. But his nature allows mm -hmm. him to do that. We can't do that. And so he's instilling the fact that we do need to take a rest day. As a human, we do. So that's the way it's looked at. And yes. also the Sabbath is a day to honor God. It's not only resting, it is a, a day of honoring God and focusing on God. But we know, well, like they've said, every single day, God is doing things because our earth is not tipping off its axis and the moon is holding us in, us in place and all the things that happen um, are because God's working. So again, it just shows us the ridiculousness of um, these stipulations they put on the Sabbath. Okay, the last few verses, and then we'll bring it to a conclusion. Then Jesus answered and said to them, now he's talking to the Pharisees, the leaders in the people, so and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in a like manner. For the father loves the son, and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So what is Jesus saying he can do nothing of himself? What do you think the meaning behind that is? Uh, means that the father had to have to teach him or show him, show him or tell him something. Yeah, if you, if you go, go back on to his upbringing as the, the years we don't hear anything about Jesus as a, a carpenter, as an apprentice, working for his dad, his yes. dad teaching those things. He could do nothing on his own, but those things had to be taught to him. Here is similar, but He's come here as a human being, 
as a man and he could do nothing of God's work. Right. And a, man, a man doesn't understand God or know how God operates. So what he's saying is, as a man, as a son of God coming here in human form, I can do nothing. Everything I do is from instructions to the Father, from the Father to me to do. Right. And I right. obey all those things he tells me to do. Because he brought me here to do those things. Right. As a man, I wouldn't know how to do those. Yes. And so that's what he's really saying. He, in his humanity, can do nothing without the, God or the Father's influence. There's people that look at this and say, well, God the Father, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity. The first two members of the, of, the, of the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son, a lot of people falsely look at that and say, God the Father is the God of judgment, the God of wrath. Look at the Old Testament, right? The God the Son is the God of love. It's the God of good things and help and good. And it's like the New Testament. And so people divide the Bible into God the Father and God the Son, saying judgment, wrath comes through him, and love and mercy and grace comes through Jesus. Yeah. That's absolutely wrong. It's absolutely oh. false. They are one in nature. They're one in the same. And there isn't no, there isn't a such thing. There's God of wrath and God of love, and they're two different entities. No, He loves just as much as He really is righteous and has to correct our sins. So that is a false way of looking at the Trinity as saying one is love and one is wrath. Because quite honestly, Jesus says, as we get later in John, all judgment has been moved. To him, he has the authority over judgment. And who judges you in heaven? Jesus Christ, not the Father. And so he is a God of judgment. He is a God of love. And God the Father is a God of judgment and a God of love. His righteousness and judgment are equal to his love and grace and mercy. He's equal across the board. And so it is a wrong interpretation. And that's why I bring it out is a lot of people want to focus on two different natures of God. It's one nature, and it's hard to comprehend that you have that much love, and you also have the feeling of correction and chastisement. When you have a child and you're bringing up a child, if you don't correct them, you, they're going to have issues as they grow up. Now, all correction is not pleasant, <laughs> It's not pleasant for the father sometimes, it's not pleasant for the recipient, the son or the daughter, or from the mother to the, to the daughter and the son. But discipline is required in order for a person to come up correctly. And so it doesn't mean the father or mother doesn't love them any less. They love them more by being concerned enough to teach them the right way. And so I'm going into this in detail because there's a lot of religions and there's a lot of people want to think of Jesus as the love God. He's the good guy. And the father's the bad guy. And so you have the bad, the bad God and the good God. And that is absolutely false. A look at this. They're, they're one in the same. They are members of the Trinity. And Jesus is just as full of judgment and chastisement and wrath. Look at the book of Revelation, which we're studying right now, Wednesday. Uh, with, with Lane, and it really blows you away as we're going to get it to later on is the wrath that's poured out, and Jesus is in control of that wrath. So I wanted to point that out as we go through this, is that that is an error in thinking. So the next question, do you think Jesus died on the cross because he loved us? Yes. Yes. He did yes. die on the cross because he loved us. That, that might be a secondary reason, though. I think he died on the cross more so because he loves God and it was going to be obedient to God's plan. So yes. 
it's very right. Yes. He, he, if he did not love yeah. us, he would not, it, it, it wouldn't have worked, but he did love us. And Diet was willingly gave himself gave his life for us. because he loved us and because he loves the father. Yeah. Amen. And mm -hmm. The next question is a piggyback to that question. Uh, did God, the father send Jesus to the cross because he loves us? He's what John 3, 16 said is God so loved the world, right? All of us, that he sent his one and only son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. So you think that is the reason he sent Jesus is for his love for the world, the love of us? Yes. Yes. The, the question, the answer is yes. The question behind that yes is, was that the primary reason or the secondary reason? And people have different opinions. And I, I'm not going to, but one of the opinions is the father's primary reason was to show his love to his son. Right. He's bringing the church his to his son, yes. his bride. Trying to show his love. So he's bringing the bride to the church. And so right. he still loves the, the son. He's willing to give up his son in order to bring his son, the bride, to bring us to be able to have a relationship with him, with him in heaven. So that's the secondary way of people thinking of it. Some people want to say that's the primary reason he sent for Christ here. Some people say that's the secondary reason. I don't think that's something that we need to worry about or be in disagreement with. You take your own you know, study and come to your own conclusion there. And, and with that, we come to the end of our final verse for today's lesson. So any follow-up, any other items? Let me, let me hear okay. one item here is there's a saying that comes out of our own culture that says something like this God helps those who help themselves. Right. Heard that right? A lot of people like to use that phrase. What I want to point out here is the Bible does not teach that right here. Was this guy trying to help himself? And it's through his helping himself that he got help. healed? No. God helped him without him ever asking. Right. Right. So again, these I, common yeah. terms that say we have this saying in our culture, God helps those who help themselves. And they're saying, be careful with that statement. The Bible doesn't actually teach that. And actually this chapter five of John teaches the opposite of that. And so I bring that up just as an FYI, that's something to think about, something to mull about. I'm not saying that's true or false. I'm just saying be careful when you hear that because this kind, this verse, these, this, this part of the chapter five actually contradicts that statement. Interesting note. So let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God that looks at us and cares for us and loves us. Thank you for giving us your son. Um, thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to the Father and your love for him and us. I just pray as we look at this, we learn um, that we need to focus. We need to worry about pleasing God and not man. That's so hard in our culture. To not, we don't want ridicule. We don't want that. But certainly, we don't want to disappoint you or be separated from you. So we just pray that you would teach us through this lesson. Please be with us this week. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.